This term we've been thinking about different names or titles or ascriptions that have been given to the Lord Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's our great physician, our master, father. And today I want the boys and girls especially to listen very carefully indeed to this historical account which I'm going to read to you now from John's Gospel, chapter 11. And I want you to see if you can hear the title that is given to Jesus in our reading today. So John chapter 11, reading from verse 1. Now, a man called Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, Therefore, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But, Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jewish people tried to stone you, and yet you are going back there? Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours of daylight? A person who walks by day will not stumble for he sees by the world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jewish people had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know that he will arise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to him, to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The person who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. We continue our reading in John chapter 11, and we just recap in those last few verses that Frank read us from 21 to 27. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. 
Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews had, who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. We're here. Where have you led him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind men have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time he is, there is a bad odor, for he has been dead for four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. This week I came across an article written four years ago by an international group of scholars which highlighted 10 of the greatest existential risks to human civilization. One of the dangers was pandemic viruses. Another is nuclear conflict. And a third, extreme climate change, triggering a collapsed infrastructure. These are huge threats facing planet Earth, which we know only too well. They are enormously challenging. But we also know that it is within the power of human beings to do something about these potentially catastrophic issues if we really wanted to. Human beings can develop va uh, vaccines to repress or reduce disease. Human beings can reduce nuclear uh, stockpiles if there is a political will to do it. Climate change can be tackled by taking measures to reduce carbon emissions into the atmosphere. Whether or not we will, of course, is another matter. But there is one thing which none of us can do anything about, even if we had the knowledge, wisdom, or willpower to try. None of us have the capacity to prevent death, our own or somebody else's. None of us have the capability of reversing the inevitability of death, except contends today's Bible reading one. And that's why today's subject is so totally and absolutely critical for all of us to hear. Shall we pray? Gracious God, sometimes we feel like a rock climber clambering up a steep and treacherous cliff edge, terrified to look down and afraid of looking up, unsure of our footing and doubting if we will ever reach the summit safely. We come then eager to hear your voice, anxious to be the beneficiary of gospel hope. Please do this in and for us, far beyond our wildest dreams, for what we pray is through Christ and for his glory. Amen. 
This morning, then, we turn to a Bible passage in which Jesus makes this startling claim. I am the resurrection and life. The person who believes in me shall live even though they die. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Of all the names and titles given to Jesus, which we along with KidZone have been looking at these last Sunday mornings, this has to be either the most fantastic or else the most delusional. But these words of Jesus are not without a context. And that context is not in some dry academic philosophical lecture theater where learned scholars debate their erudite perspectives, but rather the context of these words is an ordinary home where the family are distraught with grief, where the women are broken because their brother has died. What do you do within a context of grief? Which one of us is comfortable going into a home where somebody has died? It's so disconcerting, so uncomfortable, that many people would do anything or go anywhere but enter into a house of death. What do you do? What can you say? It's unnerving, agonizing, disturbing. Because although you go in order to demonstrate your care, all that you feel within yourself is discomfort, embarrassment, and helplessness. And the reason, of course, why we feel that way is because death is so final, so unnatural, so disconcerting and out of our control. As one doctor put it eloquently when talking about his heroic work in ICU, we can't prevent death. We can only do our best to postpone it. No wonder then that 1 Corinthians 15 describes death as the last enemy. It is a foe that always seems to win. And so it is within that context that Jesus and his disciples find themselves in Bethany, a home torn apart by death and a sister berating Jesus for taking so long to come. If only you had been here, said Martha in verse 21. If only you had managed to get here before my brother had died, then perhaps you might have been able to do something about it. And as if the two sisters had been talking, how unusual about that. Mary then later articulates virtually identical sentiments in verse 32. Lord, she said, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And seeing Mary weep, Jesus, we are told, was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. The, the words actually mean he was outraged and grief-stricken, and Jesus wept. Why did he weep? What was it that moved Jesus to tears? Was it the love of Lazarus, verse 36? Was it anger at himself for arriving too late? Was it the rebuke of these two women? Was it the disbelief of the bystanders, verse 37? Or was it the sheer force and impact of standing beside a grave and feeling the raw havoc of death and sin and suffering inflict upon humankind through the disobedience of our ancient ancestor, Adam? As Jesus experienced and participated in the human pain of loss and suffering and separation, Jesus wept. In our times of sadness and sorrow and grief, Jesus enters into our pain. He draws alongside us in our misery. And many, many people can testify to that veracity. He weeps our tears and shares our suffering. 
But thankfully, that's not all that he does. Because the text goes on to tell us that there is more. Jesus doesn't just say, I am the one who puts his arm around your shoulder, although he does. He doesn't just say, I am the one who cares and comforts you, wonderful though that is. No, what Jesus said was far more startling than that. Jesus articulates a claim which no one has ever made before or ever since. No one has ever managed to match. I am the resurrection and the life, says Jesus. This is the truth, not my truth, as if there are various truths as valid one for the other. I am the resurrection and the life. The person who believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Once more deeply moved, Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus, his friend. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, but Lord, we've already told you it's far too late. By now, verse 39, there is bound to be a bad odor. Does that choice of words, I wonder, make you smile? When your children go out for a walk with you and have the responsibility of looking after the doggy doo doos, when they lift up the deposit, how many of them say, Oh, da? there's a bad odor. I'm afraid you, that's what you call a, a sanctified version of the original language. The old AV translates, translates it, it stinketh. Death stinks. It is the most horrible, horrendous thing one will ever have to experience either with members of our family or for ourselves. And let's be honest, there is no other way of putting it. Death reeks. There's a stench about death which nothing, no one can take away except Jesus. Lazarus, he said in a loud voice, come out. And verse 44 tells us the dead man came out with his hands and his feet wrapped in the strips of linen and a cloth across his face. The one who commanded the wind and the wave to calm down now called this dead man to come forth. And the one who claimed to be the resurrection and the life now backed up his words by what he did. The words he spoke were authenticated by the sign he gave. A sign which incidentally only days later would be his personal experience. Having been put to death on a cross as an atoning sacrifice for all our sins, God raised him to life so that all who place their hope and trust in him would not have to die, but have eternal life. Now, let's make no mistake about this. Lazarus was dead. We know that because the text tells us no fewer than seven times. Lazarus was dead, and Jesus raised him back to life. But Lazarus one day would have to go through the experience of dying all over again. Not so with Jesus. Seven chapters later, we learn that Jesus willingly gave up his life on our behalf. He was buried in a tomb, but God raised him from the dead and caused him to be seen by many many witnesses, so that according to 1 Thessalonians 4, when we die, this Lord and Christ will come from heaven, and with a loud command, with the trumpet call of God, the dead will rise and be with the Lord forever. So, encourage one another with these words. You know and I know that this world is a desperately dangerous place. 
pandemics, nuclear threats, climate catastrophes. But I also want you to know this morning that every single one of these things are under God's sovereign control. And while for the unbeliever death is indeed to be dreaded, for those who hope in Christ, who is the resurrection and life, there is no fear because by Jesus' resurrection, he has pioneered the way and made accessible to those who follow him the pathway to an eternal home. Imagine a team of rock climbers located at the bottom of an imposing cliff. The lead climber is the key to everybody else's success. He sets off alone up the hill, up the cliff face in order to pioneer a route. When he makes it to the top, he sets up a bailey point by fastening the rope to a rock and himself. Now the rest of the team can safely scale the cliff, secure in the knowledge that they are tied to him. The winds may howl. The rains may fall, their feet may slip, but the pioneer will not let them fall. And this is how the Christian hope works. Jesus, the resurrection and the life, has already made it home. He has conquered the summit. And we are bound to him. So we pray. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The person who believes in me will live, even though they die. And the person who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And along with Martha and Mary, we say, yes, Lord. We believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world. Enable us to hold on to this rope which you have already secured for us and empower us to live for you in every part of our being. And what we pray is in the name and for the sake of Christ the resurrection. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, loving Heavenly Father, we come before you with praise and gratitude for the many blessings in our lives, and we seek to make our home in you where there is love and hope. We bring before you our prayers for others and ourselves, for we know that you care for us. We see your compassion through Jesus, who was troubled and wept with Mary and Martha and his friends over the death of Lazarus. We also therefore thank you that you are a God of all comfort. We give you thanks for the life of Pearl Care, and we know that she will be missed greatly by many in this congregation. We pray for comfort for her sister Hetty and her whole wider family circle. At a time such as this, much comfort comes to us through Christ. Lord, we pray for people within our church who may feel isolated who feel detached from God and faith, who struggle to connect with a virtual church. We ask that you will restore those people to you and give them a clear sense of your love. With the extra strain of coronavirus, it has brought into many homes, um, with homeschooling and working from home, loss of earnings, caring for the sick. We ask that you will be among us to bless, guide, and keep us safe that our homes will be places of love, patience, and forgiveness. We also pray for wisdom for those in government and in positions of responsibility who seek to navigate us practically through this crisis. We also offer our prayers for PCI missions workers who are based overseas, 
and who are facing the impact of the coronavirus pandemic in healthcare systems much less developed than our own. We pray for protection for them and their families. We also pray that they will be given guidance in how best to show your love in situations that are often frightening and uncertain. We thank you that you are God the Creator. We pray for this beautiful world that, we have, that you have made, and we know that many of the resources that you made, man has extracted and squandered, destroying ecosystems and putting the lives of many communities and creatures in danger of extinction. Forgive us, Lord, for our attitude towards your provision. Help us as individuals to prayerfully make decisions to correct the error of our ways and to teach the next generation to be good stewards of what has been given to us. We pray for our world leaders as they make important decisions to help reverse the destruction of rainforests, oceans, and landscapes. Lord, may our greed for more be turned into love for others and a willingness to share what we have. We thank you for your example as God the teacher. You showed us so clearly how to tell others about you and to have an understanding and an acceptance of all people, no matter their age, race, or social situation. We pray for the teams here at Bloomfield who work tirelessly to teach and provide fellowship, whether through our Sunday services, prayer meetings, youth organizations, Caris, Walkway, and so many more. Grant them wisdom as they plan and deliver your message to those in our congregation and community, and to show love to all. As this is Mothering Sunday, we thank you for all those who have been mothers to us. We celebrate the love and the inspiration of a mother, their strength, warmth, provision, and example. But Lord, we pray for mothers raising children by themselves, that they may be the strength and, and uniting bond for those families. We pray for mothers who are ill or suffering at this time, be the provider of courage for their children, as they look on helplessly. Lord, we bring before you those who would dearly love to be mothers. Allow them to see your plan of work in their lives. Lord, we pray for those who have lost their mothers. Lord, be their comfort. We pray for absent mothers who can't face what seems like an impossible task. Lord, give them courage and strength of mind. Lord, for mothers who are in abusive relationships who can't say, see a way out for them and their children, Lord, be their hope and give clarity of mind to seek help. For mothers battling addiction and emptiness, Lord, please give hope. Be the wisdom for mothers struggling to know how to deal with a child that is challenging behaviour. This Mother's Day in lockdown, Lord, we cannot physically come together, nor can many of us gather together and to share the family meal, and we do feel that loss. We know that for some, we know that for some today may be filled with sadness or loss or even regret. But as God our Father, we know we have a loving, godly parent who can hold us and carry us through the hardest of life storms and rejoice with us in the hardest of times. No matter what we have done or not done, we hold on to the fact that we are loved just as we are. As we go out into the world this week, may we take the love to everyone we meet and so further your kingdom. We bring all our prayers before you in the, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen.